Hello and welcome to the Days of Learning podcast. I'm your host, David Nelson, and it's just thrilling to be here the 1st of September. Days of Learning is that podcast where we discuss health, wellness, medicine, and community engagement. Our sponsors, we're appreciative for, for the support that we receive. We receive funding from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Wisconsin Department of Health, the Milwaukee Corp County Organizations Promoting Prevention, and the Medical College of Wisconsin. I'm just thrilled today to talk with Annika Moore and Jeff Engelman. And I say that because my beginnings in coalition work began in tobacco control. And these two wonderful professionals are here to talk about tobacco, to talk about brain health, and to talk about the idea of how we can do better about limiting tobacco and eradicating it, hopefully at one point in our lifetimes. Welcome, Annika. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks. Let me tell you about these people. Annika Moore coordinates the City of Milwaukee Tobacco Free Alliance, one of several community coalitions funded by the Wisconsin Department of Health Services to mobilize community partners to prevent commercial tobacco use and exposure. In this role, she worked with local partners to update the local smoke-free ordinances to include e-cigarettes, overseas compliance checks to make sure local retailers don't sell to minors, engages LGBTQ leaders through the hashtag Tobacco Free Pride Initiative and supports efforts led to the Hispanic, African American and Poverty Tobacco Prevention Networks. After receiving her Master's of Social Work and Master of Public Health from Washington University in St. Louis and completing the Wisconsin Population Health Service Fellowship, she has focused on addressing health inequities in Milwaukee since 2013. Dr. Jeff Engelman is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He is a neuroscientist who studies brain systems and processes that contribute to tobacco use. His previous research identified patterns of brain activity that are predictive of long-term smoking cessation. These same patterns of activation might also be predictive of the effectiveness of different smoking cessation medications. Currently, he is studying the impact of methyl, methyl, methylated tobacco on brain reward systems to help identify biological mechanisms by which menthol might make cigarettes more addictive. Ultimately, this research has the potential to inform both regulation of menthol and tobacco products, as well as to help develop more effective smoking cessation treatments for users of menthol tobacco. Welcome, Jeff. That's a lot, and that really goes to the heart of what tobacco is all about, the social and community aspects and the brain chemistry aspects. You know, I just got to ask you two, because you guys, are, you guys are in same area, but different fields. How did you two start working together? Um, I remember getting an email from a colleague um, from Toby Kalthra, um, over at MCW and just asked if we could have Jeff present to our coalition. So I think that was maybe two, two years ago or so. That's yeah, that sounds right. Yep. yep, we connected through, through Toby about two years ago. Um, and then I've been doing some work together ever since. Mm -hmm. Annika, let's start with you. Tell us about your background and how you came to this position that you're currently in. Sure. Um, so I started out actually working in HIV. That was uh, my very first um, experience out of college was as a Peace Corps volunteer in Southern Africa. And so um, that really opened my eyes to wanting to address the spectrum all the way from prevention to treatment. Um, so that's why I ended up doing both a master's of public health and social work um, because I wanted to be able to sort of see both, both angles of any health issue. Um, and when I was in grad school, I actually had an opportunity to work as a research assistant focused on tobacco policy. Um, Washington University had some grants through the CDC to do some um, best practices user guides. And um, so that really opened my eyes to the field of tobacco prevention. Um, also living in St. Louis, um, they don't have the same regulations that we have in Wisconsin. And so I was actually exposed to quite a bit of secondhand smoke, even just going to a coffee shop, um, people could still smoke inside. Um, and there, you know, there was some local movement um, in St. Louis to try to address that. And so that really 
got me engaged both professionally and personally um, and kind of gave me the commitment to continue in this field. Um, so I was really excited when I ended up in Milwaukee and um, was able to get involved with the local coalition here and then ended up actually staffing the coalition. So, you know, many of the listeners will go, what do you mean smoking in a, in a coffee shop? How long ago was that? Uh, 2008 to 2011. So this is really recent history. And for those who have never experienced that, what was that like to be walk to walk into a place where you might study or read and, and drink some coffee or, and, and have smoke all around? It was not pleasant, <laughs> not pleasant at all. You know, my throat would burn, my eyes would water. And I felt like it was my only option because it was a 24 hour coffee shop. And if I wanted to get my, my assignments done, that was my one choice to, do, to get it done, so. Annika, I want to ask you, because I, I'm fascinated by people's backstories. You mentioned Peace Corps in Africa. Tell us about that and how that has influenced the way you think about the world. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was very interesting being close to South Africa and being there for the 10 year anniversary of the end of apartheid. I was there from 2003 to 2005. So 2004 was the 10 year anniversary. Um, it was also really interesting to be a minority. I, you know, I was one of the only white people um, living in a, a rural community. Um, and so when I did see other white people, it was usually rich South Africans. <laughs> and so it was, I really appreciated the opportunity to have the tables turned and to kind of see, you know, um, what, what it's like to actually be a minority. Um, and I think that sort of set me up for really want, trying to advocate for racial equity in the US. Um, it gave me a, a completely different perspective of um, the American Indian experience in the US, just seeing how people were treated on the African content. Um, and I think it just gave me a, a greater appreciation for the knowledge that communities have and that it it really is all about uplifting community voice um, rather than thinking you know that I have the expertise to solve all the problems. And that's really carried through that that idea of being an advocate has really carried through to all of your work today whether it be with the LGBTQ groups or working with teen groups or even people who just want to quit smoking. Fantastic. Jeff, tell us about your, your backstory and how you came to be the position you're in now. Sure. So I started out um, in college. I was interested in doing research on fear and anxiety disorders, um, a lot of specifically around PTSD. So I um, volunteered to work in a laboratory where we were studying. Um, at the time, we were actually working with rats, studying the formation of fear memory and um, sort of how does fear memory form and how can we reduce um, fear memory. And about a year later, I was still working in the same lab as a graduate student and we got a grant to look at some of these same brain systems in addiction. So one of the students was working on um, opiate addiction and then I was working on nicotine addiction seeing if we could understand um, how some of the aversive motivational systems in the brain, like the fear systems, how those contributed to the negative emotions seen during nicotine withdrawal. And it turns out those experiments were providing some interesting results. And um, eventually, a few years later, I ended up started working with um, working with humans with smokers doing brain imaging work to study um, di br different brain systems and processes that we think might contribute to the development or to the, to the maintenance of smoking behavior. So um, I went to the MD Anderson Cancer Center in, in Houston, Texas and did my postdoctoral work there where I learned more about human brain imaging and how to apply human brain imaging to um, the study of tobacco addiction. I was there for about seven years and then I came up here roughly three years ago to continue that work in Milwaukee. 
um, focusing more on tobacco related health disparities. So you said something early on that I want you to go a little bit deeper on. You talked about fear, you were studying fear and anxiety. Is there a component of that that goes with the use of tobacco? So we think that, um, well, we know that one of the withdrawal symptoms of tobacco is anxiety. So if you have people who are, um, people who are dependent on nicotine, who are, um, dependent on smoking, when they try to stop, um, people typically report a wide range of withdrawal symptoms. And one of the more common symptoms is anxiety. And we were interested in studying whether that was due to the same systems in the brain that were responsible for other types of anxiety. Excellent. So let's talk about smoking um, and tobacco in Wisconsin and Milwaukee. Annika, can you tell us what you're seeing out there currently? Sure. So if we look at the statewide data, the adult smoking rate is 16% uh, right now. But then if we start to look at different subpopulations, then it's more than double that um, in the American Indian community. So I, I believe it's something like 36%. Um, among American Indians, it's uh, the rate is 26% among African Americans, 26% among the LGBT community. So um, there are a lot of nuances based on identity, based on, um, you know, even location. So in Milwaukee, the rate is closer to 20% of adults. But then when you slice that down, I think for African American men, it's, it's about double that. Um, so it really is tied to people's um, place, you know, where they live, where they shop. Um, it's tied to, you know, stress. It's, it's tied to mental health and income. Um, and, uh, you know, and although we can look at it statewide and then compare Wisconsin to other states, Wisconsin falls, I would say, somewhere in the middle. And that kind of follows, like, how we adopt policy, too. We're, we're usually not the first to adopt the policies, but we're not the last. Um, and so that then correlates to what we see in terms of the usage rates. Yes, I, I saw you nodding when you when Annika was mentioning the idea of some of the stress that she mentioned. Talk about what that means to you when you hear of these rates of smoking in our area, in our state. Um, it's so one of the um, we, t we know from the from laboratory research that one of the um, one of the factors that contributes to smoking behavior is the reduction of stress or anxiety um, nicotine, which is the active addictive ingredient in tobacco has um, at the right dosage has anxiety reducing effects so if you um, so imagine being in population that experiences um, more stress, such as people living in poverty, certain minority groups, certain groups based on your location. Um, a lot of the smokers that we talk to who live in, in the, under those circumstances, they report that one of the, one of the reasons that they smoke, not, not by no means the exclusive reason, but one of the reasons that they smoke is to help manage stress and anxiety. And that might be because of the um, anxiolytic effect of, of nicotine. So Annika, when you hear the, the idea of smoking in poverty, what comes to mind for you? Um, well, we've done something that's called the Wisconsin Retail Assessment Project um, in partnership with the African American Poverty and Hispanic Networks in Milwaukee. And so um, in partnership with uh, Dr. Liz Stadius from UWM, um, she created zip code clusters and was able to um, create three demographically distinct zip code clusters. So it tied to both race and income. And in the lower income um, zip code clusters, there is a higher retail density. So there are more stores that sell tobacco products. There's more advertising. Um, there are differences in price, so the price may actually be lower to try to encourage people to buy the products and then stay addicted. Um, and so, you know, I think if you drive 
throughout Milwaukee, you can see it with your own eyes that um, the neighborhoods that tend to be lower income have more tobacco products available and uh, are advertised. So that means people are going to be more likely to try them and then also have a harder time quitting because they're going to constantly be getting those cues to continue to purchase the products. So these are an accident then? Right. Yep, and you can even go back and look at the tobacco industry research, market research, and um, you know, in their own words, they say exactly what their strategy is for marketing the products. Talk about that. Tell us what, what, what that means to the average person. Um, I, you know, I, I think just like in the health profession, we want to try to tailor our health messaging. The industry is doing the exact same thing. So they, they're finding out what are the messages that appeal? What are the, um, what are the images that appeal to different groups? Who's going to be more likely to, to have this need? And so um, unfortunately, the, the tobacco industry has found that people who do live in more stressed conditions have maybe a greater need for something to kind of um, lessen the, the feelings of stress and anxiety. Um, so whether that's targeted advertisements in stores or, um, you know, in magazines back you know, before like the 90s, there were the billboards and even TV ads. Um, those are all tailored to really entice different populations to use the products. So Jeff, as a neuroscientist, you're not surprised by any of that, are you? No. So I wanna, I wanna have you both talk about, because one of the things that we think about is who starts to smoke? Can you guys go into this idea about what creates addiction? Um, how does it how does it work? Sure. So usually, um, when you first start smoking, or when you first when you first try, um, when you first try using using tobacco, it's determined primarily by social or environmental factors to you smoke because your friends are smoking or you smoke because you've seen a lot of advertisements and you're interested in trying it or you smoke because um there's a price promotion some kind of you know some kind of deal some way you can get get a cigarette and um not everybody who tries smoking becomes addicted um some people only smoke once or twice and, and never again where other people transition to that habitual use that eventually becomes compulsive, um, which is what we see in, in people who, who are nicotine dependent or um, sometimes you say people who are addicted to tobacco. We don't know exactly the factors that determine that that transition we think some of it might have to do with reward systems in the brain so these are systems that are responsible for helping us seek out and obtain um sti rewarding stimuli in the environment so such as food water, money, um, either either natural rewards or learned rewards. And we know that nicotine, which is, um, again, the active drug in, in tobacco cigarettes, nicotine has a direct impact on those systems. It actually binds to receptors that are located in those brain reward systems and causes an increase of a neurotransmitter we call dopamine. And that neurotransmitter is responsible for um for organizing the pursuit of reward and for um learning associations between stimuli and the environment and um and rewards so we think you know one, one vulnerability factor might be somebody who has an underactive reward system to begin with or what we refer to as low reward sensitivity so when they get that nicotine it it really increases the activation in that system so the 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 person learns that 
the, basically the person learns to continue smoking because the brain sees it as rewarding. Um, whenever you smoke, you get increased activation in that system and that in turn reinforces the behavior. So that's one possibility. Another possibility might be from the stress management side where um, if you have somebody who's anxious and they smoke and the, um, the act of smoking decreases anxiety, that might also reinforce smoking behavior. We, the mechanism that underlies that in the brain isn't quite as clear, but that's another um, another theory that we have in mind. So effectively we think it's either smoking is due to sort of nicotine enhancing the rewarding, the activity in the brain reward systems, as well as decreasing negative affect or some combination of the both that ultimately leads to um, the behavior being repeated and as you, repeat smoking over and over again, then you start to engage some of the habit learning systems in the brain. So it almost becomes, becomes automatic in addition to smoking to actively manage, manage emotions. Wow, that's a lot. So there's everything from the habit, the reward, the idea of stress management and anti-anxiety components of it, uh, the pleasure of it, the association with it, that's a lot of things that are stacking for someone to say, hey, this is actually not too bad. Yeah, it, it really, the, the, you know, the project has been designed to, to really be, um, to, to, to act in a variety of ways that ultimately continue, ultimately promote continued use of the product um, and then when you combine that with price promotions, advertising, easy access, you basically have the perfect storm of all these factors conspiring, conspiring against you to, con to, um, to basically motivate you to continue smoking. Annika, who starts to smoke? Um. I'm not sure that I have that offhand. <laughs> so, I, I guess, is it something that, um, let me say it another way. Is it something that, because I was thinking about what Jeff was saying about those reward systems, is this something that young people start or is this something that people start in, in, in middle age or when does, when does smoking begin? That's right, yeah. Um, I think something like 90% of smokers start before the age of 18. Okay. And that's partially why the Tobacco 21 movement has gained momentum. So you might have heard that the federal government actually raised the minimum age to 21. And the thinking is that that will bump up when people are tempted to start and then would reduce the level of, of addiction because the younger they are when they start, the more heavily addicted they're going to be. So what are you seeing out there is, you know, you had talked before we came on about this idea of compliance checks and selling to people. Um, is tobacco easy to get? In Milwaukee, it is. Yep. Um, so in the 2019 checks that we did, uh, we did almost 500 and there were almost 100 sales. So uh, it's about one in five attempts are successful. And what then you if you break it down that? by zip code, then it's even um, higher in certain zip codes. What do you make of that? Um, I think there's a few different factors at play too. So there are the, um, the shiny candy flavored cigarillos, uh, like the Swisher Sweets. Um, they blend in really nicely with candy. So, you know, in some cases, the retailer might not even see that it's a tobacco product. They might just think, think the kid is buying candy. Um, also, those don't have to be behind the counter. They could be anywhere in the store. It's only cigarettes that have to be behind the counter. Um, you know, I think for some stores it, that the tobacco products might be a large source of revenue. And so maybe the, the clerk is sort of weighing their chances of getting caught. Um, the, there are the, the companies that actually put a lot of effort into the point of sale. And so there's, 
people whose job it is to tell the retailers where to display the products, how to display the products, how to advertise the products. So kind of like how Jeff was saying there, it really is a perfect storm where it's like everything is set up to make it easy for people to get the products. You know, I've seen some of those, um, those, those uh, Swisher suites, if you will, and they are bright and shiny mm -hmm. and they're not behind the counter. Why is that? Um, we don't currently have a state law. There, there's been a law that was proposed a few times and it just hasn't made it all the way through. So in other words, the companies are um, doing what they do to sell the product. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it's, we've even found that oftentimes they'll be at eye level for kids. So they are intentionally trying to get the kids hooked. You know, can, can both of you speak into this? I'd like to get your perspectives uh, from the community and the scientific side of this. And, and if you don't know, it's okay. But knowing all that we know about tobacco and that it causes cancer, there are very few causal pathways, but that's one of them. How is it that this is still branded as a product where there's choice? Um, I think when it comes to addiction in general, there's um, a lot of um, there's a lot of opinions about about addiction, and, and and one of the opinions that is popular is that it's a choice. So, partly, um, it's just the same the same idea as all the other addictions. Is there are, there are some misconceptions out there about what causes the addiction and you know yes it's the choice to smoke for the first time or to use drugs for the first time but over time it becomes less of a choice and more of a compulsive behavior so i think you know partly people think you know people extend that notion that it's a choice to to habitual and users who are dependent on the drug you know they extend that that notion to to, to that um population. Also, I think that the, um, and perhaps Annika can speak more to this, I think that a lot of the, um, the companies that are selling these products use the, um, use the idea of freedom of choice when, when marketing the products and when opposing regulations. So let's say somebody, say there's a proposed regulation to ban a certain type of tobacco product. Um, one of the counter arguments is that, well, we have, we have a choice, we can use that as we want. So I think part of it is due to misconceptions about addiction and part of it is due to um, the, you know, the actors out in the, in the, in the field, such as um, people who are selling the products, they market it as a choice, as a way of combating regulations. Annika, do you have thoughts on that? Um, I, I agree with what Jeff said. I think framing it as an individual choice takes away the responsibility <laughs> because if you actually, I'm, I'm thinking of like an onion, if you actually peel away the layers, um, you'll see that, um, that like for instance, the amount of, of money the industry spends pales in comparison to what health departments have or you know health systems have to try to counteract the advertising. So for every dollar we have for prevention, the industry is spending $30 to market the products. Mm. So that, that's not a fair setup. No like contest there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, with the recent discussions around uh, flavors, so San Francisco just passed, or actually the whole state of California just, just passed um, a state law to completely ban flavored products. So that includes e-cigarettes, that includes the flavored swishers, and that includes menthol cigarettes. And the industry has tried really hard to frame it as an individual issue there. Uh, fortunately, they didn't succeed, um, but th there is a movement um, to have people say like, my, I, vote, I, vape, I vape and I vote, um, also kind of framing it as this individual behavior when in actuality many of the e-cigarette companies are owned by the big tobacco companies 
who then are spending the, you know, the $30 to promote their products for every dollar we have for prevention. Um, and so it's, it's framed in a way to keep people addicted and keep people buying the products when actually, if you kind of look at, you know, what's happening behind the scenes, um, it, it's a community issue. It's something that impacts families. It impacts the health systems. It impacts our economy. And, you know, if we look at how much of healthcare is treating people who have tobacco addiction, um, that ends up being a community burden that we all have to bear. Do you have that number of, of what that would be, what the cost of health in this space is when you talk about the idea of addiction and cancer and heart disease? Um, I think for Wisconsin, it's something like $4 billion. Hmm. You know, they talk about individual choice, but then they are targeting particular neighborhoods and tar targeting particular zip codes. And so there's no individual choice because people in those areas see it more. And when you're spending $30 to the $1, then it's like, that's no contest there. How might we in Wisconsin follow suit with, Cal with California? Do, do you envision that happening? Or how do you, do we know how it was done that where they were successful with that? Yeah, California is lucky in that they were able to do local ordinances leading up to a statewide uh, coordinated effort. So that I would say for the past five, maybe even 10 years, there have been um, smaller communities that have passed flavor restrictions. San Francisco did it maybe two years ago. So finally there were enough at the local level that it, it just, you know, the majority wanted it to happen. In Wisconsin, we have preemption. So we, we can't do any flavor restrictions locally. We could only do it statewide. Mm. So for us, it would have to look a little bit different. So the, um, the Wisconsin African American Tobacco Prevention Network has been really leading the charge on menthol. So they, they have done something that's called No Menthol Sunday, trying to engage faith communities, but also engage retailers to agree that at least for that one day, they won't sell menthol products. And so um, I think that's going to be more of a long-term strategy, but the, the wheels are starting to turn in that direction. Jeff, can you speak into this idea of menthol, what it is, how it works, and how it plays into addictions? Sure. So menthol was, um, they first started adding menthol to cigarettes, um, I want to say it was the 1920s or 1930s, but it, um, they added it as a um, a flavor characterizing additive. So it it menthol is a um, provides a minty flavor, like a peppermint flavor, and it actually is used medically as a as a local anesthetic. So the the effect that it has in the in the cigarettes is that it sort of anesthetizes parts of the respiratory tract to make the um, to make the smoke feel less harsh so it's easier to inhale more deeply or to you know for somebody who's first starting they don't get sort of as much of the adverse effect of the cigarette smoke so and it also um, then adds a, a taste that people like and that um, you know not only do they like the taste but the taste can also become a conditioned stimulus so in other words you 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 it, it becomes a potent cue for smoking itself so um when you're um so so it, it, it in other words it can we think it might enhance learning the relationship between other stimuli and the environment and um smoking so like if you you know you're you're seeing advertisements or a cigarette package or certain environments where you smoke because you also have that other powerful stimulus on board which is the menthol it might make it easier for your brain to form all of those associations um between those environments and smoking um one other issue that was that has been proposed more recently and that we are currently conducting research on now is the the, the idea that menthol might also increase the rewarding or the reinforcing efficacy of cigarettes. So about three years ago, there were some papers published using animal models that have shown that menthol actually binds to the, some of the same receptors in the brain that nicotine binds to. And 
it makes those receptors more sensitive to a lower dose of nicotine. So basically it, it augments the reinforcing effect of nicotine. You, you can take a previously, um, previously sort of lower addictive dose of nicotine, um, combine that with menthol, and then the animals will show signs of of addiction to what otherwise would have been a much higher level of nicotine. So it, it basically, um, we say that it shifts the dose response curve to the left and that it, which means that it's um, potentially enhancing the, the addictive potential of nicotine. Now that hasn't, that has not, that finding has not yet been extended to humans. And that's what one of our research projects funded by Greater Milwaukee Foundation is we are going to be using brain imaging to compare menthol versus non-menthol smokers to see if we see any differences in, in some of these brain systems in, in humans. And if that's the case, that could provide more, more information that regulators and decision makers could use about, about regulating menthol as a potentially addictive constituent of the product rather than just as a as a flavor i know you have to go through the trials but what do you think what do you hypothesize here um i mean based on the findings from the animal models and based on a bunch of previous findings from human studies so a lot of human clinical trials where they looked at smoking cessation and smoking behavior um those who smoke menthol cigarettes, especially African Americans who smoke menthol cigarettes, have a harder time quitting long term. So my hunch is that we're going to see um, we're going to see differences consistent with um, the idea that menthol enhances the addictiveness of the of the tobacco. But we will um, we'll wait to find out what we what we see. Wow. Annika, when you hear things like this uh, about the idea of taste and a numbing agent and a reward, those crafty companies, what, do you, what, is, what is the reaction from the community when you tell them that this isn't just a chance thing that they're doing, that this is something that they're doing with intention to make it even harder to quit? Yeah, I think when people do hear that, um, it kind of wakes them up a little bit. And um, so we, you know, we have tried to to do some community education and, um, you know, would love to see more statewide movement to address the issue since we will need to have the statewide solution. Um, unfortunately, we've, we've seen targeting um, actually at Pride Fest, which is partially why our um, work has focused on the LGBT community. There was actually a menthol promotion at Pride Fest um, where they had a, a pleasure lounge that was set up um, that people could go through and then they were able to buy a pack of uh, Newport cigarettes for a dollar. Um, so again, multiple strategies were at place. We had, you know, the associations of, of pleasure with the product, you had the, the product at Pride Fest, so kind of tying it to people's identity, and then you had the price promotion, um, not to mention then the addictive qualities of the product too. Um, so we've, we've tried to sort of highlight how historically menthol has been targeted to African American communities, and now the industry is trying to shift and find other communities to target it to, in addition to you know people who fall in the intersection so people who are african american and lgbt you know now now there's double targeting happening um and so i we're from my perspective we're fired up and ready to do something about it and we need the rest of the state to like also wake up to this issue too you know i'm fired up about this <laughs> good grief Annika, I want you to start us off. Talk about this idea of e-cigarettes and vaping and all that goes with that because, you know, a, a lot of us are not familiar with the terminology and what it is and how it works um, and how it fits into this whole thing that we're talking about here. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, so... I remember when I was doing my graduate studies in St. Louis, 
the e-cigarettes were just coming on the market. So this was, you know, 2008, 2009. I remember there was a kiosk at the mall in St. Louis where people were selling the e-cigarettes and that was like the very first introduction. Um, and at that time, you know, people didn't re really know too much about it. You know, no, I remember my, <laughs> the director of the center I worked at, he, he didn't really think it was gonna catch on. <laughs> And now, you know, 10 years later, lo and behold, they've caught on. And, you know, we look at the statewide data, 20% um, of Wisconsin high school students report using e-cigarettes. Um, if you followed the news last year, there was the lung injury outbreak. So actually Children's Hospital was at the forefront of addressing um, some of those cases um, that seemed to be tied primarily more to THC vaping, but there were still 11% of people who had the lung injury who said they were vaping only nicotine. So what that highlights to me is that there's, um, there's lack of regulation. We don't know exactly what's going into the vaping cartridges. You know, we know there's nicotine in them. We know there's flavorings, um, but you know, there could be other chemicals in there too that are causing harm to the lungs. Um, there was a National Academy of Sciences report that was put out in 2017 that, uh, you know, did find some conclusions based on the evidence so far and found that, you know, even the aerosol that comes out of the e-cigarettes does increase the particulate matter. And so that is adding to the air pollution. So that's partially why we worked with the city to add vaping to the smoke-free law, because for people breathing it in, um, it's polluting the air. So we want to keep that out of um, spaces. Um, you know, I think the long-term studies still need to be done to determine the long-term effects, but short-term we are seeing, you know, there have been lung injury cases, there is the um, impact on the, the air quality. Um, we know that the flavors are a big reason that a lot of the teens start using them. So, um, you know, any flavor that you can imagine, gummy bear, cotton candy, uh, creme brulee, <laughs> they, they've got it all. Um, and that's really, uh, why we're seeing California now, you know, and other states are banning the flavors because that's partially what's driving the usage. Um, there have creme, even been creme studies. Creme brulee yeah. nicotine. Okay, <laughs> I have heard something new. Yep. <laughs> um, Jeff, is the process the same with, with the vaping and e-cigarette as it is with tobacco? We think that for the most part, it is when people are vaping nicotine there you're still sort of going through that process of of becoming dependent on nicotine and that's what what ultimately drives the behavior at first when the when the first generation products came out i also didn't think they were going to catch on and part of the reason was that with those products unless you really knew what you were doing so basically unless somebody showed you how to use the product the right way it was difficult to extract the same amount of nicotine from the e-cigarette as it was a combustible cigarette. So initially with the, the, the first generation products, you really weren't getting as much nicotine and therefore, you know, the, the idea was, well, maybe you're less likely to become dependent, but as the products have progressed, I think we're onto the fourth generation now. Um, that no longer seems to be an issue. You can you can easily extract enough nicotine to you know to become dependent. So we think a lot of those processes are the same. Um, again, w based on the assumption that nicotine is the primary active constituent of of cigarettes, so you would get the same effect with nicotine e-cigarettes. There is some. There are some hypotheses that there are other chemicals in combustible tobacco smoke that also contribute to the addictive potential. So you may not have the effects of those chemicals, but um, with nicotine, the primary driver, the, the overall process is, is going to be the same. And then when you add in all of those flavors, again, those, the, you know, because people like flavors that also can enhance the rewarding effect of the product and, and encourage use. I can't get past creme brulee. <laughs> Annika, you had mentioned that 20% of high school students have done or do yeast cigarettes. 
what's the cost on this? So who's using e-cigarettes and vaping? Is it same as tobacco or is it a different demographic? Um, from what we have heard anecdotally and um, you know, from limited data, we've seen that it, it tends to be more suburban teens that are, that are using the products. Um, we also have seen from the retail assessments that they're marketed to higher income neighborhoods. So in Milwaukee, it was more of the Upper East Side um, so, and then like out to the suburbs that have more e-cigarettes available and more advertising. Um, I know when I first heard about the Jewel, which has been you know the most popular e-cigarette, it was from a parent um, of a student in Whitefish Bay. And so Whitefish Bay, I would say, has had more issues with e-cigarettes than um, Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, but we are, we're hoping to actually dig into um, differences within Milwaukee Public Schools because we know that it might vary by neighborhood and, and by um, school rather than looking at the district as a whole. But the, the products do cost a little bit more on the front end, but then um, you know, usually once you have the device, then you're just buying the refill cartridges and then it ends up being a similar cost. But each Juul cartridge has the same amount of nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. Mm. And at last I saw that you could get like four cartridges for about $16. So it'd be roughly $4 per cartridge compared to about $8 for a pack of cigarettes. You know, I'm, I'm old enough if, to have kids and even grandkids. If uh, my kids were using that product, I, would I know it? You know, like, you know, when we were kids, if you were around anybody from smoking, your folks would go, you've been around somebody who's smoking. <laughs> It, it, are e-cigarettes the same thing? Do parents know if kids are using e-cigarettes? No, and the products are designed to, to uh, kind of fit in with school supplies. So like the Juul, you actually, re you charge it, you can charge it in your computer. So teachers have thought it was just a USB drive. A flash drive, sure. And then, you know, there's the Swarin, which is more of a teardrop shape, which kind of looks like a, maybe like a whiteout or a highlighter. Um, there's even like makeup compact shaped e-cigarettes. So um, the, there's a website called tobaccoischanging.com that's run through the State Department of Health and it, it provides really nice fact sheets and it has pictures of all the different products. So I would really encourage anybody to go to that website. Again, tobaccoischanging.com. Are there some that are... Um, do there, are there some product like that that don't... Have, have, emit any vapor or are they all do they all have something that comes when you exhale um they all have something the the jewel tends to have less vapor than the older generations so for a while i think it was maybe the second or third generation e-cigarette um you could uh like titrate the amount that you were vaping and so people would try to do vape tricks and have big vape clouds um, and now it's shifted more to being more discreet. So the, the Juul was actually designed to be more discreet so that people could actually use it like in the classroom. So people will say, you know, that they just like vape into their shirt and the teacher doesn't even notice. Ooh, okay. Okay, learn something new there. Um, Jeff, I wanna ask you, we wanna start this way around the health. Um, when people are long-term smokers, what happens to their brain? So um, we think that, um, at least in some of the studies that I've been involved in, we've seen that um, in some long-term smokers, at least, you actually see um, down regulation of the brain reward system. So as some, when you first start smoking, smoking is actually increasing the activity of those systems so it you know smoking becomes rewarding but over time over years of smoking and we don't know the exact timeline but um over the course of you know sort of a, a smoking career um as you as you progress those brain reward systems become down regulated so that rewards other than smoking like 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 activities that you used to find rewarding, um, those actually have less value. And so basically, smoking is one of the only things that can activate those systems after the systems have been down regulated. So effectively, you are um, 
you've created a situation in which smoking is is the most rewarding alternative of an array of behaviors so um you know given a choice you're going to want to smoke a cigarette and we we found um using EEG and fMRI studies which are different ways of measuring brain activity we found that that pattern occurs in maybe about half of people who who are long-term smokers and the people among the people who who exhibit that pattern it's much harder to quit um, they have lower six month cessation rates than people who have more of a normalized brain reward system so one consequence that we know about is that in some people at least it's going to down regulate um down regulate reward systems and potentially make other activities less rewarding um we there's a lot of speculation about what might happen to other brain regions but we it what we i don't know as much about those systems off the top of my head but you know anything from um cognitive uh, deficits during withdrawal. So as you're going through nicotine withdrawal, some of the systems involved in say, manipulating several pieces of information at, in memory at once, we call it working memory or um, directed attention. Um, some of those systems may um, sort of suffer deficits in activation during withdrawal, which might explain why people who are trying to quit also often report difficulty concentrating, um, irritability, that sort of thing. So we think, you know, there may be long-term changes in some of those cognitive systems as well. And then third, of course, is the um, aversive motivational systems that tend to become more active during withdrawal as well. So some of the same systems involved in producing anxiety and stress responses, those become active during the acute withdrawal phase of nicotine. So basically your brain, after a long time smoking, your brain has changed such that smoking is, is um, more rewarding than other alternative behaviors. Not smoking becomes aversive and then you also might experience cognitive deficits that are relieved by continuing to smoke so sort of a combination of activity in those three systems renders smoking highly probable even when somebody's trying to quit wow annika can you speak into uh the other body systems that smoking impacts um, I'm most familiar with the impact on heart health and lung health. Um, and as a non-smoker, what really got me interested was the impact of secondhand smoke on heart health. So as states were passing statewide smoke-free laws in restaurants, bars, and workplaces, there was a reduction in heart attacks and a reduction in emergency room visits um, just for the non-smoker. Um, so that I, I would say as a driving force for me to continue this work is to try to protect people from that. Um, you know, and then obviously it, it's a, a leading cause of lung cancer, um, asthma, COPD, <laughs> other issues like that. So when you say secondhand smoke then, so, um, you know, the idea that if the parent's smoking um, and they have a, a baby around them, the child's inhaling that that tobacco then too, aren't they? Right, right. Or, you know, before the statewide smoke-free law was passed, anybody working in a restaurant or bar was getting a lot of exposure throughout the day having to work in, in that setting. Let's talk about that. How has smoke-free law enhanced the health of our, our community and our state? Um, well, we've definitely seen a shift in social norms. You know, I hear a lot of people say they're so used to clean air now that if they smell someone smoking, it stands out. Whereas, it, you know, before 2010, it used to be the reverse where people were so used to smelling it that they didn't even notice. Um, we've seen a reduction in our overall smoking rate. So, um, you know, prior to 2010, it was in the 20s and now we're down to 16%. 
Mm. Um, so that definitely is partially attributable to the, our statewide smoke-free law. Um, I would imagine it's had an impact on, um, you know, on youth choosing whether or not to start smoking and, and also helping adults quit. Um, you know, if people are around it less, then they're more inclined to want to try to make a quit attempt. Wonderful. I want to have each of you take us 10 years out. And we continue this work. What are you seeing? Jeff, I'm going to start with you. Ten years out in your research around this, what are you, what are you seeing and where do you hope to, to go with it for yourself and for the future generations of researchers? Sure. So ten years out, I think we are um, really going to be focusing on the on two things one is we'll be focusing on the subpopulations who still smoke who still use combustible cigarettes so rather than studying all smokers from all backgrounds we'll be focusing on the groups that are still smoking at the highest rates because the groups that are smoking at the lower rates those rates are trending downward and they're going to be you know below 10 percent Whereas some of the other more at-risk groups, the smoking rights may still be high. So we may be focusing on, on groups such as um, Native Americans, African Americans, LGBT, um, also people with comorbid substance abuse or comorbid mental illness. Those are some of the, the groups that currently their rate of use of combustible cigarettes is higher and existing treatments may not be effective. So I think one area where we'll be in 10 years is looking at developing more effective interventions for subgroups that are still using combustible tobacco. The other area is we will be conducting research around better understanding the use of these non-combustible products such as e-cigarettes. Um, and there's, al there's always new products coming out as well, a relatively new product that came on the market is called heat sticks or heat not burn tobacco. So this product is actually approved by the FDA as a, um, a reduced risk tobacco product. So the FDA has a mechanism there that all new tobacco products that come on the market. So anything that's, anything that's currently on the market is, is fair game, but any new products that come on the market have to be approved by the FDA either as a smoking cessation intervention or as a reduced risk tobacco product. And what we mean by reduced risk is the product, um, all the, basically the manufacturer has to demonstrate that using the product is less risky than using cigarettes. So, um, these these heat sticks, although I don't understand the exact mechanism by they work, is is basically it's real tobacco, so it's not it's not nicotine containing juice like you would see in an e-cigarette. It's it's real tobacco, and there's this device you can use to heat the tobacco. So rather than combusting it, you're you're heating it, and somehow um, I don't know if vaporizing is the right word or aerosolizing, but somewhere there's some mechanism by which you can then inhale the tobacco, not as smoke, but as a byproduct of heating. And your exposure to carcinogens is, is demonstrably lower than your exposure to carcinogens from smoking combustible cigarettes, but you're still getting nicotine and maintaining the nicotine addiction. So this project is kind of a double-edged sword. It may be an advantage for people who use combustible cigarettes and have found no other effective way to quit. They've tried all the medications, they've tried all the counseling, they've tried, you know, everything that's available. They still can't quit. It may make sense for these people to switch to a reduced harm product. The other side, though, is what happens if people who are non-smokers get a hold of these products, especially youth, that might start the process of nicotine addiction, which could, um, you know, which then, then, then starts the process over again, where people are using these products and potentially might transition to other products such as cigarettes. So the other thing is, is we're just going to have to watch and keep an eye on the new products that are coming out, watch how they're marketed, who they're marketed to, and 
um, potentially study what what their effects are on on the brain and behavior. Monica, take us 10 years out and talk about, if you would talk about two fronts, this idea of how people are quitting smoking and what's tobacco look like, or are you in a whole new job because we've eradicated it? Um, so I see it going down one of two paths. I think there's a best case scenario and there's a worst case scenario. And a lot of it depends on how engaged the community is to take a stand. Um, I would say worst case scenario, the 20% of Wisconsin teens that are using e-cigarettes, you know, stay heavily addicted, switch to conventional cigarettes, and then, you know, go down the road of a lifetime of addiction and, and illness. Um, and, you know, I'm sure the industry will come up with new products to keep people addicted, you know, if, if there are restrictions on e-cigarettes, I'm sure they're, they're already developing new technologies um, to make sure people are continuing to buy products. Best case scenario is that, um, you know, we increase um, support and funding for tobacco prevention. So we're able to counteract those $30 to the dollar of, of advertising and marketing. Um, best case scenario would be that, uh, you know, the, the trend we're seeing for flavor restrictions takes off nationwide. So, you know, would love to see that take place in Wisconsin to get rid of menthol along with the, the flavored swishers and the flavored e-cigs since that's really what's driving the youth usage right now. Um, best case scenario would be more support for people to quit. Right now, we have the Wisconsin Quit Line. We don't have a ton of options for in-person support groups. And so we know that um, the Freedom From Smoking program from the Lung Association is really effective. It's an evidence-based practice. It's eight sessions to help people um, you know, break the habit and learn, um, learn new ways of coping um, if there could be more supports like that available that would help people to kick the habit. Um, would love to see more corner stores selling healthier products, whether that's, you know, tobacco, alcohol, food. Um, would love to see a shift in, mm -hmm. you know, the corner stores being a center for health rather than a, a center for addiction. Uh, would love to see our festivals supporting that too. We're, one of our initiatives is trying to work towards smoke-free festivals. Um, so really lifting up people's culture and, and identity and, and um, and whatnot in a positive sense that is life-giving and promotes health. Um, yeah. So there's, there's more work to be done. For sure, yep. <laughs> uh, Annika, it, what is the, the quit line? So if, if listeners want to pass this on, what is the quit line number, please? It's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And then there's also the website smokefree.gov that has um, apps and texting and other online supports. Annika, if people want to get a hold of you, how would they do so to, to support your initiatives? Sure, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, City of Milwaukee Tobacco Free Alliance. Um, you can do a, a direct message on there and we'll get back to you. Um, my email is amohr at communityadvocates.net. I'm happy to have new people join us. Right on. Jeff, any funders that you want to reach out to to say uh, the, the most exciting thing that they need to fund now? Um, I think I think definitely the some of the most exciting things to fund now is is to is to look at mechanisms that might underlie why certain groups of people are still smoking where others are not. I think we have a pretty good understanding of how smoking works at the level of the general population, but it would be important to study, you know, what factors both environmental and neurobiological are, you know, contributing to, to cer certain groups still smoking more than others. Right on. Anything else either do you want to tell us at this time? Um, well, we haven't said anything about COVID. <laughs> So I, I guess it's worth just mentioning. Let's talk about that. How <laughs> that, has COVID um, impacted your work? Um, as I was saying earlier, you no, know, it's really made it more difficult to reach out to youth and for us to do the compliance check. So that's, I would say, that been the main impact for the work directly. But um, 
it's also just worth noting that, um, you know, COVID does impact respiratory health. And so people who smoke or vape might be at higher risk for having a more severe illness. And so it's just a good reminder to, um, to encourage people to quit if they can, and then try to keep the youth from starting and um, sharing that quit line with people who might be ready to make a quit attempt. Right Jeff, are you able to do your research during this pandemic? So we are um, getting restarted um, right about now, probably, you know, probably next week. Um, we've had to had to make some changes um, because our research involves brain imaging people like participants do still need to come to the to the medical college campus to complete the the study um, we've moved a lot of our questionnaires like a lot of our questionnaires and a lot of our pre-screening to use you know computer-based um, tools but um, for people who are eligible to come in for the study um, you'll still be coming on campus. Um, we were requiring that that all visitors to campus wear masks. Um, all of our research staff will be wearing appropriate personal protective equipment. We'll maintain, you know, six foot distancing. And um, you won't actually have to wear a mask during the scan while you're in the scanner because you're the only person, you know, within six feet. But then between every scan, the, the equipment is thoroughly disinfected um, prior to the next study. So we were on hold for from about March through now, but um, we are able to to get back up and running, which I feel is important because this problem of tobacco use isn't isn't going away. Um, if anything, if people are more stressed out about the economy or about, you know, being inside you know, just worried about worried about um, anything related to COVID. If anything, because people are more stressed out, that might be prompting them to smoke more. We don't we don't have the final numbers yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. So it's important to keep keep working on this this issue of tobacco in in sort of in spite of the ongoing COVID pandemic. Jeff, are you are you recruiting for for studies then right now? Is that something that you that you'd like people to contact you about? Um, sure, we will be, um, we will be up and running and I would say we'll be ready to start recruiting. We're doing a few pilot pilot sub subjects now, but I would say closer to the end of the month. If anybody is interested in, in helping us recruit or learning more about the study, um, they can reach out to me at J Engelman, J E N G E L M A N N at mcw.edu. Right on, and they can get to me as well. You yeah. know, this, this, this work is so important. Um, I, I'm a, such a strong believer in not only what we do now, but how we're reaching back to the next generation. Um, we're talking about children, uh, babies who we don't want to becoming, um, we don't want them to become addicted. So your work on the research end and your work on the community end with these with the populations that are currently tobacco usage just is so important. I can't thank you both enough for both coming on the show as well as speaking into both the risks and the dangers and some of the cool things that are happening in, in, in our community around us. So thanks to both of you. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Oh, and one more question. Uh, will you guys come on again and give us an update? Because I think this is this is so important that we need to have an update on on this. And as your work progresses, will you guys come back on one sometime? Of course, yeah. Sure. And I'd love love to have the colleagues from the Disparity Networks join us too. Oh, let's do that. Creme brulee, creme brulee. I'll never <laughs> think of it the same. All right. Thank you both, and thank you for joining us today. Wow. That was something else. I was on the edge of my seat for most of that. The thought that companies are building a product to make you want to use it that eventually will kill you. Something wrong with that. You know, I've never been a fan of, of companies that want to profit from harm. 
And so we need to do all we can to speak into justice and speak into systems that can support the health of our community. I hope you'll, you'll find Jeff and Annika's work interesting, that you can support them in some way, drop them a note, told them that, tell them that you hear, heard about, the, about their work on the podcast. Drop me a line if you want to um, support us. You can uh, register for the podcast and it'll come to you. It'll subscribe to the podcast and it'll come to you on a weekly basis. We have some exciting guests coming up in the, in the future. Um, and we hope you'll continue to stay tuned. I'm David Nelson, and this is Days of Learning Podcasts. Continued health and wellness to you and to yours. Bye now.